Good evening. Goodbye Forever by Matchang Rumshe. Chapter 17, Part 4. Were they wearing lederhosen? Rose laughed. You know, like Heidi or whatever. No, I pondered. Now that you mention it, they weren't wearing anything. Well, that doesn't surprise me, laughed Valerie, who, noticing the question on my face, continued, Dreams usually connect with what's happening in your life. So two naked girls kind of make sense. Yes, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. I replied in order to steer the subject away from my dreams. Shakespeare? Rose inquired. Yes, Shakespeare. There's a Shakespeare quote for almost everything. And if you add blues to the assortment, there's almost nothing for which you can't find a suitable reference. Do you look for meaning in dreams? asked Valerie. No, that's more in your friend Emily's line. Light, seeking light, doth light of light beguile. So ere you find where light in darkness lies, your light grows dark by losing of your eyes. Yet more Shakespeare, laughed Rose. Where's this from? Speech by Barone from Love's Labour's Lost. The whole thing runs like this, if I can remember it properly. Why, all delights are vain, but that most vain, which with pain purchased doth inherit pain, as painfully to pour upon a book, to seek the light of truth, while truth the while doth falsely blind the eyesight of his look. Light, seeking light, doth light of light beguile. So ere you find where light in darkness lies, your light grows dark by loosing of your eyes. I've always liked those lines. Yeah, but all delights are vain, eh? laughed Valerie. That's a sombre perspective. It's not yours, I hope. By no means, I smiled somewhat wanly. I was just thinking of the one line, so ere you find where light in darkness lies, your light grows dark by losing of your eyes. That light in darkness sounded like the dream world, and it occurred to me that trying to find meaning in dreams was like losing your eyes. There is no sense in trying to analyse dreams. So you don't go along with Jung and all that psychoanalytical stuff? Not really, no, because all you analyse when you analyse a dream is the waking mind that remembers the dream. You can only attempt to analyse a dream when you are dreaming. But, opined Valerie, that would mean you'd have to be conscious that you were dreaming when you were dreaming. Is that possible? Yes. Can you do that? I mean, have you ever done that? asked Rose. Yes, I replied, realising that I'd said more than I wanted to say. Not often, but I have had experiences of being conscious in dreams. I think you're more like Emily than you let on, Vic. Yes, in some ways, perhaps, but I tend to think of myself as a realist, even though there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of, etc. Hamlet chirped Rose, delighted that she'd pin the reference. Oh, day and night, and it was wondrous strange, Valerie misquoted and laughed. 
and therefore as a stranger give it welcome, I concluded with a wistful yet serviceable grin. What was it about the creature I seemed to be? The esoteric Emily found me too pragmatic, too unspiritual. The pragmatic Rose and Valerie had me pegged as a closet woo-woo. Still, I'd thrown them off the trail with Shakespeare, and so we talked until it was time to hit the road and see what lifts might come my way. I decided early in the morning I'd better leave for Farnham. I'd have been open to a relationship with either lady, but a scene with both was not exactly part of my vision of what I did with my life. The fact that I was unable to refuse a situation that wasn't something I would have considered somehow disturbed me. I thought I had some idea of who I was, even though there was no solid, permanent, separate, continuous or defined I in the Buddhist sense. I pondered. So there really was no I and I could be a surprise to the I of any moment in time. It wasn't that my torrid night with Rose and Valerie was something I failed to enjoy or something that I came to regret. It was not so simple. I wouldn't go that way again, but the chances were <clears throat> that a situation like that would never come into being again. I started pondering the nature of karma and what my karmic patterning was. Rose and Valerie were the secondary causes which had facilitated behaviour of which I would have otherwise dis disapproved. For whatever reason, I have always been entirely monogamous and have never thought, as some fellows did, that a harem would be ideal. I just wanted a lady friend who would be my friend in all senses and we'd have a life together as friends. The word friend had always been important to me and I valued my friends. That was what I was. But obviously what I was was capable of mutating according to the secondary causes the world presented. I'd have to be on my guard in that respect. Secondary causes were a minefield. Mr Love, back when I was eight years old, had been the cause of my love of blues. Had Mr Love been a secondary cause? Had I been primed to love blues? Had I had a previous rebirth in the Mississippi Delta? A romantic thought, no doubt, and I had no time for such fanciful speculations. There were too many lunatics who imagined they were the rebirth of someone or other, and I had no interest in swelling their ranks. It was curious, however, that blues had grabbed me the way it did at the age of eight. The Vikings had also grabbed me, but that interest had faded into insignificance by the time I left junior school. It was maybe only the things that grabbed a person lifelong that meant anything. <clears throat> Would blues always be the big deal it was? And what about Vajrayana? The two religions, as I sometimes thought of them, seemed hardwired in me, so there seemed little chance of either vanishing. Rose and Valerie were a little disappointed that I had to head back to Farnham and, to tell the truth, so was I. The thought of further nights with the two lovely ladies was not relinquished without regret, but it felt entirely unwise to remain. That was not really me, but it wasn't entirely alien either. How could that be? 
I knew that both polygony and polyandry had existed in Tibet because I'd read about those modes of marriage in Mipam, a Tibetan novel by Lama Yongden, the adopted son of Alexandra David Neil. Funnily enough, Rose and Valerie styled themselves as sisters, but they were entirely humorous about it. Rose was on the short side with dark curly hair and Valerie was tall with straight blonde hair. They couldn't have been more different in appearance. Rose could have been French and Valerie Scandinavian. Part of their sister act was to wear identical clothes as often as they could. But whatever their concept may have been, I did not see myself as a polygonist whatever the Tibetan system might be in rural areas. Neither did I intend to drift through life becoming whatever the world made of me through fluke circumstances. Shakespeare flitted through my conceptual infrastructure. Romeo. I dreamt a dream tonight. Mercutio. And so did I. Romeo. Well, what was yours? Mercutio. That dreamers often lie. Romeo. In bed, asleep, while they do dream things, true. Mercutio. Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. Yes, Queen Mab had been with me, and she'd been a white incandescent space of meaning since I was an infant. Be that as it may, and whether Rose and Valerie were Queen Mab's fairies or not, I wanted to be at the driving wheel as much as that was possible. So I made my way homeward with the help of my thumb and a cardboard sign that read, Reading, Farnham. I got lucky. I didn't get to Reading, but I got as far as Newbury. Then I picked up a lorry that was bound for Aldershot and the driver was kind enough to change his customary route in order to pass the bottom of Woodsfield Lane. I had all the luck. Now, if I'd been an eternalist, I would have read this as a sign that I'd made the right decision vis-à-vis -vis not staying longer with Rose and Valerie in Exeter. As I wasn't, I didn't. But I did check the phase of the moon as it was on the night of visions in Exeter. I have had a most rare vision. I had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. What I discovered made no sense at all. Why, thou hast put him in such a dream that when the image of it leaves him, he must run mad. The phase of the moon when I saw the two dark-haired ladies was the actual phase of the moon on the night. It had been a full moon. The crescent moon and gibbous moon I saw were not the reality of that night. And yet I'd thought the two dark-haired ladies had been a dream I remembered on waking. It was what I thought I'd seen when I was awake that had been a dream. I have heard my daughter say, she hath often dreamed of unhappiness and waked herself with laughing. I looked around me at the familiar world of my parental home and laughed. It looked entirely as I might have expected it to appear. <laughs>